Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started in our message. Lord, thank you that we can study your word. And as we spent time talking about taking your word in, about prayer, as we talked about worship, and witnessing, and serving, Lord, I pray that you would um, speak to us today through your word as we talk about stewardship and stewardship of our whole lives. Help us to discipline ourselves, not for the sake of the disciplines themselves, but the, for the sake of striving toward godliness, training ourselves to be godly, doing these things so that the Holy Spirit can work in us to make us more like you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so, so like I said, we've, we've gone through several spiritual disciplines. Today we're going to talk about stewardship. Um, I, I thought, you know, there are several ways I can try to introduce this in a humorous kind of way, but I'm not going to do that um, because, you know, that's, I feel like that's kind of been there, done that, trying to talk about. See, the, the thing is, is when you talk about stewardship in church, everybody thinks it's going to be talking about money. And we are going to talk about money, by the way. But not just about money. It's bigger than that. But before we get to that, let's set the stage as we've done every week. Um, uh, it, this idea of training yourself to be godly, of doing these things um, to achieve spiritual health and to maintain spiritual health, we find that uh, concept, at least sort of foundation for that, in Paul's letter to First Timothy, uh, letter to Timothy in First Timothy four. In verses, uh, the end of verse 7 and beginning of verse 8, we've been reading this aloud every week. I'd like for us to do that again. So if you'll read it along with me. Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so we've talked about these other disciplines, and we're going to do this through the end of March. And so we've got... Um, a few more that we're going to talk about. Will will be preaching in a couple of weeks on March the 8th, I think is the date. And so be sure to be here for that. He's going to be talking about the discipline of learning, continuing to learn. And so I'm excited for what he has to bring, uh, to bring us then. On the last Sunday of March, we're going to wrap the series up talking about um, how do we persevere in these disciplines. Like this isn't a one-shot deal. It's not like we talk about worship for a week and then we practice worship for a week and we say, okay, I got this worship thing down. Let's move on to the next one, right? You have to fold this into your ongoing practices. And, and, and so but how do you persevere in these things so that you continue to grow in godliness? And so that'll be what we talk about on the, to wrap the series up. So you need to be here for that as well. And then, um, and Will and I will do that together. And so we'll, we're still working through some of that, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, so as we continue on about spiritual discipline, stewardship has to be one of them. Like it, it's, we cannot escape that. Um, and, and as I've studied these, one of the things that I've noticed or that has occurred to me is that it would be easy for us to look at these disciplines as a list and that you can tick off the list or that you can work through them in order. But that's not how they work. They are much more like a web with all these interconnecting points. And so worship and prayer are connected, and prayer and Bible study are connected, but Bible study and worship. And stewardship, like they're all connected in these intricate ways. And when one of them, when one of them becomes weak, it weakens to one degree or another all of them. And so, for instance, when, when, when our prayer life becomes weak, then the way we take Scripture in becomes weak as a result of that. And the way that we worship becomes weak as a result of that. And the way we serve becomes weak as a result of it. And that's true of any of them. As we start to get weak in one of them, the others around it weaken as well. It, it, it's, 
They just don't have the strength and the, the, the stability on their own. Like that's why they're not like a list that we can just check off and I've done this one, now I'll go do this one. That's why they're so why I see them as being so interconnected. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times, you know, people talk about the church. All the church does is ask for money. That, you know, those greedy, rich creatures and they're just we should show them our budget, shouldn't we? Um, you know, the truth is that Scripture talks about money a lot. Jesus talked about money a whole lot. We we hear people say we should get back preaching like Jesus about heaven and hell. Look, Jesus talked about more money more often than heaven and hell combined. Money's a big deal. And, and here's why money is a big deal, because money is a picture of stewardship as a whole. Now, stewardship is much bigger than money, but money is a, it's like a picture. It's like the physical demonstration of stewardship that, that we can all kind of see and get our, get our hands on and can, can understand stewardship based on the way we understand money. And stewardship is about our entire lives. The, there's a there's a concept that is fundamental. It is absolutely foundational to stewardship. And this concept is not about money. It's about stewardship. It's and, and here it is. Stewardship is about ownership. What I mean is the steward is not the owner. The owner has a steward. The steward is not the owner. We often forget that we're not actually the owners of anything. Here's something I think is kind of kind of humorous that will help uh, help demonstrate this thing about ownership. Be my friend. 
Let me ask you something, Vanessa. Would you make friends with someone who had more than you? Yeah. Would you make friends with someone who had less than you? Yes. See, from what I'm hearing, you're not the one with the problem. Honey, your friends are going to like you, not for what you have, but for who you are. Do you understand me? I guess so. And Vanessa, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but yes, you are rich. She is. Not because of things, but because you have a family who loves you. Thanks, Ron. But when I grow up, I'm just not going to have so much money. That way my kids won't have any problems. <laughs> Vanessa? Yeah. These poor children that you're going to have, <laughs> please don't send them over this house, baby. <laughs> <coughs> Vanessa, your mother and I are rich. You have nothing. <laughs> You know, there, there are so many times, okay, my boys are back here nodding their heads because they've heard that. Not, not the rich part. We never profess to be rich. But more than once when they would talk about my this or my that, I would have to remind them, you have nothing. Your mother and I, all these things that you claim are yours, we own those things. But here's the, the reality is that we don't actually own those things either. Like, that's the thing about stewardship. You have nothing. God owns it all. And so, let's talk about that for a second. What is a steward? In, in the simplest terms, a steward is a manager that administers something that belongs to somebody else. The Bible has several illustrations of stewardship um, throughout the Old Testament and a number of Jesus' parables in the New Testament. And so, uh, we're, we're not lacking any examples or any... Uh, we, we can define it pretty clearly. The reality is, is that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if you profess to have denied yourself and take up His cross daily, if you've given your life to Him, the life you live is not yours. It is His. You're nothing but a steward. You've surrendered your claim to everything. He owns it all. Now, according to our own acknowledgement, right, if those things are true, then that means that everything that you and I profess to, to own, to have, whether it's our life, our time, our talent, our resources, our whatever, all of those things are actually His because He created them and He owns them and they're, at, and they're at His disposal to use any way He wants to use them. Every moment of your day is His. It's not really yours. Every word that you speak, your tongue that gives you the gift of language belongs to Him. He owns your mind. He owns your thoughts. He owns your attitudes. He owns your opinions. And all of them are to be governed by Him as their owner. Because they are there to bring glory to His name and to further His kingdom. He owns your family. He owns your job. He owns your house. He owns your clothes. He owns your bank accounts. He owns it all. And it is His intent that we acknowledge that in very real, tangible ways by the way that we use all of these resources. Whether it is the money that's easy for us to see and touch and feel and, and think in terms of money or whether it's something more abstract like our time or our thoughts or our energy. But the truth is it's rarely the case that we give him that kind of use of those things that he already owns. And I say we intentionally, because I am not good at this. I probably know better than anybody in this room today. But I've become convicted of this. That we are called to be disciples and 
You cannot be a growing disciple of Jesus without coming to terms with the need to be growing in the area of stewardship. It, it is just part of the package. It is part of the deal. And if we are not becoming progressively better stewards of all of life, then we are not progressing in discipleship. So in the few minutes I've got, I want to spend, I want to talk about this idea of stewardship. Now there's no way that we could cover every aspect of stewardship, and I'm not even going to try, and so you should breathe easy about that. I want to talk about two main areas that I think we struggle with. If not the most, then they, if we could get these two straightened out, then I think we could figure out the rest, honestly. And those are, are these. It's time and money. If we can figure out how to be better stewards of our time and our money, then I think it'll be a lot easier to steward our thoughts and our words and our on and on. And so, the clock and the dollar. And so there's two passages of Scripture we're going to look at this morning. Um, the first one is uh, about time. It's found in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Paul writes this to the church at Ephesus. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Or in some translations, um, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so this passage talks about the stewardship of time. Now, let's remember that when we're talking about Scripture, the most important thing is context. If we don't get the context right, we will not understand the passage. And so where this verse is placed in the book of Ephesians, or these verses are placed in the book of Ephesians, are very important. Ephesians has a certain flow to it. Ephesians is largely, uh, you could say, about relationships. He, Paul begins talking about our relationship with Jesus. He moves on to our relationships with one another. And then he goes to our relationship with this world. And how we're to stand, how we're to walk as Christians in an unchristian world. And so Paul explains our position as Christians in the first three chapters, and then he, he gives some practical advice on the Christian life. Chapter four, he talks to them about Christian unity and some other subjects and, and, and instructions on how to do that in their personal relationships within the community of faith. And then chapter 5, he starts by telling us that we have to walk with one another in love, even as Christ loved us, as Christ gave himself for us. And then he says that we have to walk as children of light. By the way, walk means live, right? It's our walk in this world. We, we today still use that kind of metaphorical language. That's not an uncommon way to speak. We're to walk as children of light. We have to be mindful that our lives should be pleasing to God, should be bringing glory to God, that we should be obedient. And then he tells us that we're to walk, walk, walk wisely, redeeming the time or making, most, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. It's foolish of us, I think, to think that we could be concerned about how we spend money or that God is concerned about how we spend money, but that He doesn't really care how we spend our time. And yet, to watch a lot of believers, they they try to get the money right. You know, I tithe and I support this and I give to that, and I and you look at the way they spend their time. It's like, are you kidding me? Here's the thing: is that I think God cares maybe even more about stewardship of time than money. And I don't want to minimize the importance of money and we'll get to that, but, but time is far more valuable than money. In fact, time makes you money. Right? We make money with our time. How many, how many of you have ever used that money to buy back time? Or you can't. It, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> there was a in the 70s a singer, Jim Croce, he had a song, Time in a Bottle. Remember that? And it became a, a hit. And here's what's a little ironic is all the money that was made off of that hit could have probably loved to have used it to bought more time because it became a hit after he died. 
time in a bottle, right? You can't buy more time. You can't. We all get the same 24 hours a day. We can spend it wisely. We can waste it. It's your 24 hours, except it's not. But you can't get it back. And you can't get more. I wasted an hour today. I'll make it up. No, you actually won't. Paul gives us direct instructions here to be very intentional about how we spend our time that it's important. That's part of what it means to be wise. Wise people use their time well. It means that we're able to think through the decisions that we make and how to, how to use our time. We run those decisions through the through the filter of scripture and prayer. The people that we worship with that we can trust. And we think strategically about how to spend the moments of our lives. That's what it means to redeem the time. It means to make the most of the time you were given. To make the most of it for Him. For Jesus. For the kingdom. We're not meant to idle away our, day, our days on things that don't have any kind of value. But to spend our time on things that have lasting, eternal value. To seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Knowing that He's going to provide us with all the things that we need. The things that the rest of the world spends so much time and energy and worry trying to accumulate we can trust that God's going to provide those things that we need. I think it's interesting that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus follows up some teaching about money, about <coughs> stewardship, by telling us that where our heart is, that's where our treasure will be. And we think about that in terms of money, but I think it's even more true with time than it is money that where your heart is will be revealed by where you spend your time. It's For some people, it's making more money. For some people, it's just entertainment. For some, it's sports. But for some, it is the kingdom and the pursuits of the kingdom. Now, I don't... I don't mean that we can't ever do things that are just enjoyable. God wants us to recreate but that's kingdom work resting on the Sabbath and, or taking a personal Sabbath and, and, and replenishing our soul replenishing our spirit replenishing our body those are important things and that's kingdom work so don't waste those opportunities either he's calling us to be wise in how we spend our everyday lives he knows that we have schedules to keep and responsibilities to meet and jobs to go to or whatever else it is. But he also knows that we live in a world that is uh, hostile toward him and toward the message of the kingdom, toward the gospel. He knows that um, this world around us is intent on taking us down a road that leads ultimately to destruction. God wants us to make intentional choices about the way we spend our time. Are those things that we do, are they things that are passing, things that just, that this world, things that don't last? Or are they things that have eternal value? Don't get me wrong, there are good ways to spend time that still don't keep Jesus at the center. And that may be the most dangerous of all. I've said before, I'll say again, I'm, the older I get, the smarter my dad is. Um, and I remember, I don't know why this stood out to me many years ago. He said, and, and I, he's, he's probably said much more profound things than this, but this stood out to me, is that the greatest enemy to what's best is what's good. Whereas we do these good things, and because we think we're doing good, we forsake things that are so much better. 
kind of like when C.S. Lewis referred to making, you know, instead of spending a day at the beach, making mud pies in a slum because it, it's what you know. It's, there's nothing wrong with playing and making mud pies, but you could have had this other thing that is so much greater. The good is the enemy of the best. Jesus calls us to be good stewards of our time, to be intentional about how we spend our lives. As we grow as disciples, we have to discipline ourselves in how we use our time. We, we discipline for health, right? We discipline, you know, theoretically. The things we eat, how much sleep we get, exercise, all of those things. We discipline ourselves. Spiritually, we want to discipline ourselves to take in the Scripture and spend time in prayer and worship both together and privately and, and to do outreach and witnessing evangelism. We want to do service, right? We, if we're going to do those things, we have to discipline the way we use our time. That's what discipline's about, by the way. It's, it's about working toward a goal, but it's about doing it intentionally. And our goal is to be more like Jesus. Our goal is to train ourselves to be godly. If you really want to follow Jesus, if you really want to be his disciple, you have to be disciplined in how you use your time. It's going to become even more important to you than how you spend your money. You'll realize your time does not belong to you. He's trusted it to you. And because of that, he'll hold you accountable for how you use it. Stewardship doesn't just involve our time. It does also involve our money. The clock and the dollar... People often see uh, value, uh, more value in their money than they do their time. But I, I disagree. Now, if, you, if you've got your Bible and you want to turn to it, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 16 in a couple of minutes. But I want to, I want to um, set the stage. I want to give you a little context. Jesus is, um, he, he, the words that we're going to read, he, he's just told... A, a parable. It's what we've come to know as a parable of the unjust servant or the unjust steward. The parable, um, the, the steward is caught wasting his master's money, stealing his master's money, essentially. And his master calls him to account on it. He realizes he's been caught, so he begins to use the master's money to make money for himself as he gets out, right? He's sort of see the stage that's set there. He's, he's stealing from his master so that he'll have money because he's about to lose his job. But he'll have money, so he'll probably have some friends. He'll get a place to stay, and he's going to be okay, he thinks. Now, I do think there's something interesting in this passage, or in this story, is that Jesus never excuses what the servant does. Like, it's clearly wrong. But he does point out that, um, that it's an example of somebody who is shrewd. In fact, this is what he says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. And he's not condoning his dishonesty, but he, he does make a point that the guy is clever. So watch out. That he's smart. The, that if the wicked can be this clever, this shrewd in the things that are temporal, that are of this world, how much more should we be in dealing with the things that are eternal? That's, that's the point. So let's look at verses 10 through 13. Jesus says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And then this well-known passage, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
We can't be trusted with something as fleeting in this world as money. He's not going to trust us with truly valuable things in the Spirit. You will not achieve spiritual maturity if you're not a steward over your time and money. If we're not faithful with that that belongs to somebody else, the things God's given us, who's going to give us something of our own? And Jesus tells us, can't serve two masters. Think about money in these ways. Money is a trust. It is something that God has entrusted to our care, something that belongs to Him, but that He has given to us to invest on His behalf. The idea is that He'll get a good return on His investment. If He trusts us a little, but we use it wisely, He'll trust us with more. That's what He said. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Money is something God has entrusted to us. It's a trust. But it's also a tool. Money is a tool. He expects us to use it. Like we use our tools. We don't put them away and... If you've got a shop that you're more concerned about keeping your tools dust-free and organized and then you're actually using your tools, that's not really a shop. And they're not really tools. Like they're not accomplishing anything. Tools are meant to accomplish something. Jesus expects us to use money as a tool, not as a thing we just accumulate. He wants us to use it to reveal His glory. He wants, it to use, wants us to use it to share the gospel. He wants us to use it to uh, help others. He wants us to use it to find ways to bring glory to His name. Money is never something that just becomes an end into itself. But it is a, it's a tool. It's something we use to accomplish a greater good. Think about it like a piece of rope. You've got somebody that's drowning in the water. The rope isn't what's valuable. It's their life that's valuable. The rope is just a tool that you throw out there to save their life. You've got to use the tool. It's also Money is also a test. And I will tell you, we fail this test on a pretty regular basis. God often gives us something to see if He can trust us with something more. I, I believe that. I mean... There are several parables about this concept that Jesus tells. We see examples of this in Scripture. We can't trust us to make good decisions with the things we have. It stands to reason. We can't be trusted with larger things. By the way, just to, as a little bit of an aside, God, since it belongs to Him, since He is the Creator, since all of it came about because of Him, it is His. He can do anything He wants with it. And so it could be that God gives you as much money as He wants to give you or leaves you with as little as He wants you to have. <laughs> when we're dealing with somebody who has our very life in His hands, we shouldn't quibble over something as small and immaterial as money. We should work to pass the test to use it as He commands us to use it. And I think the last way to see money is a thermometer, not a thermostat. You know what the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer is? A thermometer just reveals the truth of what's going on. We can go, there's a thermostat on the wall, and it's got a thermometer in it. We can look at the thing, and it just all it does is report the truth. It just tells us it's this many degrees in the room. But when you activate the thermostat, it affects the temperature in the room. Money should not be a thermostat in your life, affecting and changing and directing and causing. Money, however, is a thermometer in your life. It does reveal, it does tell the truth about what's going on even in your spiritual life. To that point, I think God's called us to invest our money, our resources, into His eternal causes. If we're not doing that, 
then we are not growing as Christians. We probably need to take a hard, long look through the lens of Scripture and what that says about you. I don't want to be harsh or I don't want to use hyperbole. I don't want to be over the top. But I, but I believe the Scripture is pretty clear. Jesus said it in a very few words. You can't serve both God and money. He talks about money more than heaven and hell combined. He, Jesus seemed to think that the use of money was an important indicator of our spiritual life, of our spiritual condition. If we're really His disciples... If we really have surrendered to Him, one of the most basic, most visible signs of that internal transformation is how we walk in obedience to Him in respect to our money. Because that's just an easy evidence. There's an old adage about it. You want to know what's it? From. You can tell me what you think is important, but if I want to know what's important, show me your checkbook and I can tell you what's important to you. Because I can tell you based on how you spend your money. Go through the Scriptures, both the Old and New Testament. You'll find this message again and again and again. Jesus calls us to surrender our lives to Him. And how can we say that we're willing to give our life to Jesus when we're not willing to give Him our wallet? How can He truly be Lord if He's not Lord over our bank account? And don't say, well, money's not really that important. God's more concerned with how I treat my neighbor. Or God's more concerned about how I do this or how I do that than how I spend my money. I would say that how you spend your money speaks directly to how you treat your neighbor. Do you give when it's needed, are you willing to fund ministries and mission activities? Do you support your local church here at New Beginnings? I mean, we do the things we do with the singular purpose of making disciples, bringing people into the kingdom and teaching them so that they can do the same. We do that a lot of ways. We do that by providing some physical help. We do that by hosting worship gatherings every Sunday morning and teaching classes and having Bible studies and we do that by a lot of things but, but that's the goal at the end of the day with all of them you cannot separate the stewardship of your money from the rest of your spiritual life it cannot be done I think the clock and the dollar tell the story of our lives the simple matters, these are simple matters of obedience, and that's how we define discipleship, is growing in obedience and holiness to Jesus. These are evidences of where our heart is. As I said at the beginning, I'm, this, is a, this was a hard thing to get ready for because it was convicting to me. This is difficult because I know that we all struggle with at least some area of this. This is nothing that, that none of us have mastered this discipline, nor any of the others. But we should be on a pathway of growth. Of, we should be on a track of discipleship, becoming more and more like Jesus, seeking to be who He's called us to be and to do the things He's called us to do. I, I want to leave you with um, some things that I think are pretty practical to help with stewardship. I didn't make slides for these. I might should have, but they're not complicated. I, I think you'll be able to take these down. The first is, if this stewardship is an issue, if stewardship is difficult for you, start by um, taking time to assess your time and money expenditures. It's remarkable. I think most people probably don't have any real idea where their time goes or where their money goes.
my mother a number of years ago. She she married my dad. Um, she had taken one semester of junior college and then they got married and this was in the late 60s and she now has a husband and they're in Mississippi. She doesn't need college, right? This is the way of the world in that time and place. And so um, many years later, it was after um, Kathy and I were married, I guess, when she started back to school. She had one semester of college and she, she told my dad, she said, you know, I, we don't have a lot of money, but we've got as much as we've ever had. We just don't know where any of it's at. So I'm going to go to the junior college, and I'm going to take a, a, just a simple accounting course, and I'm going to get our checkbook straightened out. Well, there's a whole long story that follows that about her and finishing college and going on to work on her master's degree. But, but that's just adults with adult children and with grandchildren who had no idea. right? That's very typical, actually. Honestly, if it weren't for a piece of software that we enter all of our banking transactions into, I'm not sure we would know. Right? We, at the end of the year, we can pull up a report that tells us where all these things go. Most of us don't really have a strong picture of where every dollar goes. But maybe more dangerously, we don't have a good picture of where our time goes. You want to test that, go somewhere simple like the dollar store and buy a cheap talent make quick little notes every time you do something. How did you spend this last hour? What did you do? Maybe you don't want to know. But I think it would be a profitable exercise to just for a few days to keep track of your time and your money and maybe that would help you become better stewards of it. A, a second suggestion would be to set some goals. This is a discipline after all. Set some goals so you can grow. You can start out uh, simply uh, by setting some goals to where you want to spend your time and money. So, so I've got 24 hours in a day. How do I want to spend them? What do I want to do with the, those hours? There's some things you have to do. There's other time that you can do what you want to with. What are you going to do with that? It could be as simple as writing it down on a piece of paper, the, a list of the things you need to accomplish, or the amount of money you want to allot for this or that. That's, by the way, called a budget. <laughs> but, but if you're going to set goals, make sure that your goals head you in the right direction toward obedience to what Jesus expects of us as stewards. And here's the one that's a real challenge. As you assess how you use your time and money, and as you set goals on how to use your time and money, exercise some faith. Step outside of your normal routine. Grow. Get outside your comfort zone. Do what God has commanded you to do. Trust Him that He's going to take care of things. I think you'll find he'll demonstrate to you that a life surrendered to Christ can accomplish more in less time than one in your own control. And that your dollars will go further and last longer than money under your control if you trust him with them. So at the end of the day, we're disciples or we're not disciples. At the end of the day, we trust him or we don't trust Him. At the end of the day, we are good stewards or we are not good stewards. But He calls us to stewardship. Not just stewardship of our money, stewardship of our time, stewardship of our life. Will you bow your heads with me? I'm going to pray in a moment close the message and we're going to sing a couple more songs I'm going to give you a chance to respond if the Lord is leading you and I don't know what it might be about maybe there's something about the way you use your time or, or how you ought to use your money in better ways <coughs> He's directing you and those are things you'd like to pray about I'd love to meet you in the back there in the foyer and pray with you about those things
maybe maybe you just want to make a commitment right there where you're at in the on the little tables around you there are some response cards feel free to fill one out I would like to know what God's doing in our worship gathering how he works among us Jesus Jesus calls us to complete surrender he calls us to follow him in totality not just partially not a call to lip service. It's a call to serve Him with our lives. It's what Jesus did for us. He gave His life for us. What does your stewardship say about your faith? What does your stewardship say about your relationship with Jesus? What does your stewardship say about your discipleship? Lord, help us to be the stewards that you call us to be. Help us with all of the time that you've given us and all of the resources that you've given us, with our bodies, with our energy, with our money, with everything that you blessed us with. Help us to realize and to live like those are not our things. That they belong to you and that we're to use them for your glory and return them to you. That you hold us accountable because you love us. We ask it all in Jesus' name.